All right, here we are. Thank you, Randy and Joyful Noise. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we now want to know Jesus. So we ask that you send the Holy Spirit to lead and guide not only our minds, but most importantly, our hearts, that we might know him and his great love. To understand, Lord, how you want us to be one, even as you are one with the Son and the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. So in her book, The Grapes of Wrath and Grace, Barbara Brockhoff tells this story. It's a story about a group of Americans who are in Rome, Italy. They're on a tour. Their tour guide is an Italian who speaks English. Their bus comes to a stop across from uh, Piazza, and there's a de- de basilica that they want to go visit. So they go visit, and they're about ready to uh, come back to the bus, and they all spread across on the sidewalk to pass. And the Italian tour guy says, no, 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 you mustn't, you mustn't, mustn't do that. If you go across one at a time, they'll hit you. You have to, you have to go together. See, if you go together, they won't hit you because they're afraid they're going to hurt their car. <laughs> well, that's a little lighthearted uh, story about the power and the strength of unity. There's a lot to be said about unity, isn't there? Especially the unity of the Spirit. Jesus Christ was very serious about unity. In fact, it's the Apostle John who quotes the very prayer from the lips of Jesus about unity from chapter 17. Jesus is praying, As you sent me into the world... So I have sent them into the world, and for their sake I consecrate myself, that they also may be sanctified in truth. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who believe in me through their word. By the way, an aside, that's you and me. That they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us. So that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be even as we are one. I and them, and you and me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you love me. So, what word stands out? Obviously, I emphasized it the word one. Look at how this goes. In verse 21, that they all may be one. But then in verse 22, that they may be one even as we are one. And then verse 23, that they may become perfectly one. So one as we are one to perfectly one. This is is the importance of oneness. Unity is important, even vital to the message that God loves the world. The reason for oneness is so that the world may know that the Father sent His only Son into the world to bring the world back into a one relationship with Him. Of course, we all have to acknowledge that we as Christians are far from being one, are we not? There's a story of a pastor, Lutheran pastor, who dreams that he's going to heaven. And he's there at the gates of heaven waiting to go in, and he hears screaming and and yelling. And he asks the gatekeeper, well, what's that? And the gatekeeper says, that's the anguish in hell. So the Lutheran pastor can't help but ask the question, are there Lutherans in hell? And the gatekeeper says, no. And of course, the Lutheran pastor, yes, we had it right, all right. Then, of course, he can't help but asking this question. Are there Baptists in hell? No. Oh. Then he says, are there Baptists in heaven? No. Well, are there Lutherans in heaven? No. You see, there are no denominations in heaven. 
only Christians. Truly. There is no denomination in heaven. I think this dream was, was opening up to this pastor um, the words of Paul, which says, I say to everyone among you not to think of more highly than he ought to, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned to them. Let me read this again. I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned them. In churches, there are people who know or think they know better. Unfortunately, this leads to disunity, and disunity leads to disagreements, differing opinions and dissensions, and even disappointing departures. This is terribly unfortunate because the people who don't know Jesus around us, they pick up on this. And this... <clears throat> While unity or oneness is a glory to God, a strong witness of God's grace to the world, unfortunately, a lack of unity does just the opposite. It affects the authenticity of the gospel. It undermines the message of God's love and shows our hypocrisy. And you know there's personal harm that's done here too. People who choose to give up in the church they not only are cut off with their relationship with the church, but their faith is weakened, shaken even, and sometimes even lost. Like the illustration in the beginning, it's dangerous walking out into the street alone, standing in the middle of the traffic, arguing. There is strength and security in being together. So how can we be one? How can we be in unity? Perfectly one, in fact, as Jesus prays for. Is that an impossibility? Well, I think this. I think unity, unity can begin with these words that come from the Apostle Peter. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And the real power in that statement as Jesus identifies in response to Peter, is this. And on this rock, on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. It was that statement, that statement, where the church springs forth from. We know the meaning of, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You see, from that testimony, the Spirit will bring relational unity, a oneness that lives in the body of Christ, my church, your church, our church, says Jesus Christ. It's a unity that continues as the Apostle Paul explains in Ephesians chapter 4. For one God... Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, a common faith that we share together that follows from our faith beginning as we believe in baptism. The quote from Paul, There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. This is a common faith. It's based on the Word of God. We need to know it. We need to believe it. We need to experience it. We need to live it. And without the whole experience, what do we have? Not much. You see, what's going to happen is if we don't have the Word of God living in us, our relationships, our oneness is not going to be authentic it's not going to be Christ-like relationships. You see, our common ground is found in knowing, understanding, and believing, and living out. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And that leads to fulfilling Christ-like relationships, a oneness. That is such a key word, oneness. 
You know, there was, a pastor was, uh, was doing a children's message. And there was this little three-year-old girl there um, within the group. And he was talking about unity. Um, the church has to have unity. The church needs to get along. The church needs to love each other. Get along, love each other. They need to be one. And the little three-year-old girl raises her hand and says, I don't want to be one. I want to be four. <laughs> Getting along. Jesus taught his disciples how you could do that. It's the two great commandments, isn't it? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind. Right? And then what's the second part? Love your neighbor as yourself. This is God's word. We need to experience it. We need to live in it. Loving your neighbor is basically saying and doing this. I put you first. If you hurt me, not only will I not get even, I'll even let you hurt me again, if needed. And I'll hang in there with you for as long as you need me. I accept what God is doing to me through you, even if I don't like it. If things aren't going well, know this, that whatever it takes, we can work it out because we share in the oneness of God himself by the power of the Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ. That, my friends, is what sacrificial living is all about. Sacrificial living. That's what God calls us to to do Jesus Christ. Paul calls each one of us into the church to deny ourselves, but he also says you need to accept the diversity of the body of Christ. He talks about the body of Christ with different gifts, and yet to be one. He says about denying ourselves. I appeal to you there, brothers, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies as what? A living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. The diversity. He writes, for as in one body we have many members, and members do not all have the same functions, so that we, though many, are one in body in Christ and individually members of one another. And yet, in this, we are to be one. Jesus Christ, who allowed the pain and suffering in this world to be placed on his shoulders, stretched wide the cross, stretched wide by the cross, forgiving us all we've done, has shown us that we matter. We really matter to him. God makes a real, authentic, one relationship with him through the precious blood, sacrifice, forgiveness, and life everlasting that Jesus Christ gives to you. And that, my friends, allows you to have oneness with the person sitting next to you. If you have somebody sitting next to you, maybe the person behind you or the person in front of you. The unity of this church A fountain of life, Lutheran church, is found in nothing more complicated than the friendship we have, the unity of relationship we have with Jesus Christ. One, together, in Christ. That's what really, really matters. In His name, Amen.